Next up, we've uh, uh, a man who's made a lot of television appearances, and uh, hopefully this will be one of them. So, can we put our hands together and sit quietly for Mr. Jeremy Hardy? <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much. Good evening, The Junction. Well, it's very nice to be in Cambridge. Well, I say that it's actually a nuisance for me because I live in South London. It's a hell of a way to come to work. It would have been easier if you could have come to me, but it's done now, so you mustn't blame yourself. <laughs> but um, I'm in a bad frame of mind anyway because I've got these new biodegradable bin liners that break down naturally as you carry the rubbish down the stairs. <laughs> but uh, I have uh, been to Canada, since you ask. And... Um, <laughs> The thing that strikes you when you get to Canada is Canada's enormous and it's far too big for what they've actually got there. <laughs> there is nothing to justify the size of Canada whatsoever. That's why they all have to wear those thick padded jackets to try and fill up some of the room, you see. It's true, they have an advert for Canada. They say, Canada, a world of possibilities. Nothing definite at all. <laughs> but you're probably thinking, well, hold up, here's a rum do, a left-wing alternative comedian slagging off a nation of people, but it's all right to slag off Canadians, it is. It is, because they're racist bastards, they are. All of them. It's in their blood. But you know that, um... You know that film, The Godfather? Yeah, film, yeah. Godfather, they've probably been on in Cambridge, Cambridge now. You've had the 633 squadron, yeah. Well, um... <laughs> There's a film called The Godfather, and there's a bit in it where they want to intimidate this band leader. So he wakes up one morning, and there is a horse, his head next to him on the pillow. But Sarah Brightman put up with that for years. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, did, uh, I did this thing called jury service. Now, I know you don't care, but I'm going to tell you anyway. I did this thing called jury service. Now, it was in January, uh, and this is a weird thing, this jury service business, because... Um, Everybody I know who's ever been to prison was innocent, right? Which <laughs> tends to put you off in the first place. Plus the fact that uh, something about jury service destroys your faith in humankind. Because, I don't know if you know the marvellous Sidney Lumet film, Twelve Angry Men, with Henry Fonda. Yeah. Well, there's a big flaw in that film, which is that on a real jury, everybody would be the Lee J. Cobb character. Now, I know you're baffled and you're thinking, oh, he's just trying to impress us and we're supposed to understand that. <laughs> but... But, he's doing the sessions on us, but, what I mean is, <laughs> any jury is a random cross-section of lower middle class suburban bigots. <laughs> I don't know how they do it, but they do. And you'll be talking to these people and they'll say, well, I don't know why they're dragging it out, do you? I mean, it seems as plain as the nose on your face. It's open and shut so far as I'm concerned. I mean, what, are the, what can the defence possibly hope to pull out of the hat now? Don't you think we should wait till he will hear what he's been charged with? No, no, no! <laughs> Look at him. I mean, it's obvious, isn't it? I mean, it's written all over him. He's no stranger to this sort of situation, is he? I don't suppose he is. That one's the judge. That's why they don't have black judges in this country, because most juries would convict them. <laughs> it's true. And you have to listen to all these cobblers while people with bath mats on their heads speak Latin to you. But there is crack to be had. I mean crack in the old-fashioned sense. I don't mean crack in the modern sense. There is crack in the modern sense, but it's all sealed up in plastic and it's exhibits. But there is fun to be had because what you can do is you can ask questions. You ask questions of the judge. Things like, don't you think you're getting a bit old for this sort of thing? <laughs> but judges are actually... Judges are beyond the realm of comedy. Judges are in the realm of surreal experimental theatre, really. <laughs> you can't really send them up. And our judge was no exception. Our judge was like, Members of the jury, I don't know much about the law, but I know what I like. <laughs> and then you go off into this little room. Now, I wanted to get our bloke off. He was as guilty as ourselves, but he seemed like a nice bloke to me. And I thought, well, I've done that. I can't very well send him to prison for it, can I? <laughs> so, <laughs> I wanted to get him off. Now, if you want to get the bloke off, you've got to be made foreman of the jury, although in the film it's Martin Bolson who makes complete bollocks of it. But uh, I was brilliant, actually. I played the Henry Fonda role. Actually, unfortunately, I did the Henry Fonda role from On Golden Pond, which <laughs> just confused the issue, really. But it was good. It was just sort of inappropriate. But um, I got the bloke off, because what you do, you get made foreman of the jury, because then people believe you, because you've got a name. You're the foreman. You're the gaffer. You're the one who sits in the shed reading the mirror all day, tells other people what to do. And people listen to you, because you're called the foreman. You acquire a completely spurious knowledge of the law. You say things like, look, we're not here to speculate. That's pure conjecture. 
Is it? What, fingerprint evidence? Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, fingerprints are hearsay. Are they really? Yes, in fact, even to mention them was contempt of court. Oh, really? No, in fact, it was treason. It was treason, and there's still the death penalty for treason, and I sentence you to death. <laughs> Anybody else? Not guilty, thank you. But they do this thing. They have this thing called um, circumstantial evidence, which the trouble is, you see, when the prosecution have no case, they've got this thing called circumstantial evidence, which is any old shit they can dig up, like your O-level results and things like that. <laughs> and they just throw it at people. And uh, the jury gets worried about this sort of thing, you see, because they've got all this stuff, and the jury is confused by this, because they, sa they say things like, what well, I mean, what was he doing with all that money on him? I mean, 70 pounds in cash. <laughs> if he's not a drug dealer, why doesn't he keep it in the building society like sensible people? And they say, he, he says he owed the money to a man and he was going to hand it over to him in a night's club at half past 11, but no one stood up at half past 11, are they? I can't abide people like that. Right-wing people always tell you there's two sides. There's two sides to everything, my friend. You see, you feminist suffragist people, you complain about the sexual harassment business, but we don't read in the newspapers the stories about when it's the women sexually harassing the men. We don't read about that, do we? No, because it doesn't happen, that's why. <laughs> oh, periodically it possibly happens. Periodically gangs of gays go out straight bashing and Asian youths pour into fish and chip shops and call all the staff Kipling, you know. I mean. <laughs> Men are terrible, though. Men have this completely dubious morality, because all men side with other men. There's this unwritten loyalty, even new age, you know, non-sexist, reconstructed men. That's what will happen is the woman will say, Did you hear about next door? Well, it's terrible. Bob took a chainsaw to Yvette and the children. Well, I think we should hear Bob's side of things before we pass judgment. <laughs> all prejudice in society as well. There's a lot of prejudice against gay people and, you know, people with HIV and, and people who might possibly have HIV. And uh, I tried to get some life insurance. I phoned up because I thought, you know, get a little bit of life insurance would be good. And uh, phoned up and they said, well, have you ever had homosexual relations? I said, well, it was an uncle we used to wonder about. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't swear to it. Used to watch all the Bette Davis films with a passion, but I, I don't know. <laughs> there was a lot of prejudice. And people say that homosexuality is unnatural. But I mean, since when did we care about things being natural? Babies incubators aren't natural. Ventilin inhalers and dialysis machines aren't natural. I tell you what natural is. Natural is earthquakes, wasps, shit, piss, pain and death. <laughs> and stinging nettles. <laughs> and then you get people being tolerant, you know, sort of tolerant of gay people, but they say, well, I don't mind them, but why does, you know, why do some gay men find it necessary to go into toilets to pick each other up? You think, well, probably for the same reason that people find it necessary to go into toilets to have a piss. Because you're not allowed to do it anywhere else, that's why. <laughs> Mind you, they don't have public conveniences anymore. They, they've all been done away with the old public toilets because, uh, you know, cutbacks and so forth. There was a time you could go out, you could have a cup of tea, leave your home in the secure knowledge that if you needed to evacuate your bladder... It's a charming euphemism, isn't it? Evacuating your bladder. I have to go and live in Wales until the war's over. <laughs> it's like when you're in hospital and they say, have your bowels moved today? Yes, they've gone to live in Milton Keynes. <laughs> They feel strangely at home there. <laughs> but, um... <coughs> but no, um... Yes, what I was saying was, um... Yeah, they, they've all done away with the toilets. You could, you could go out and if you needed a wee in the old days, you, you could just go into a public toilet and it was all sanctioned by law and it was all fine. And they've all been closed down. If you find a public convenience these days, it's sort of surrounded with barbed wire and sandbags and machine gun turrets. <laughs> and there's a sign saying, open 6.30 to 6.35 a.m. alternate bank holiday Mondays. <laughs> Nearest public convenience, Yucatan Peninsula. <laughs> and they did away in London. They did away with all the old red phone booths because they said that we were urinating in them. Well, the phones didn't work. What else are you supposed to do in there? <laughs> if a lift doesn't go up and down, you might as well piss in it, mightn't you? That's what I say, hard but fair. But, um, <laughs> toilet, the ones, the ones that are, the ones that are still going public toilets are in a sorry state because they've done away with the cleaning people now as well as part of the cutbacks. They've done away with all the cleaners. There used to be these little people who lived in the toilet in a little lean-to conservatory thing. And they, that was their job. They scurried out periodically and cleaned it. And they've all been set free in the countryside now, those people. <laughs> but, um, people in the entertainment things, talk a lot about phallic symbolism and things. People in the arts and stuff, people do. People go on about things being phallic, like electric guitars, all oh, that's a phallic thing, the motorbike, the stallion, you know, and toy trains and boats and zeppelins, watering cans, phallic symbolism. And if you're a bloke, it gets on your wick after a while, all this comparison. <laughs> now, I know men play into this. I know there comes a point in every man's life where he is holding a cucumber, 
and for some reason, he does this. <laughs> but it's something a man has to do. <laughs> and in the old days of a CND march, in the 80s, you go on a CND march, and people would be saying that there was a correlation between the missile and the penis. They'd be saying, the missile is a penis. And you'd be thinking, oh, do me a favour. It's pretty hideous, but it's not going to take out Leningrad. I mean, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> No, people do. They harp on about this phallic business. Like, say if you drive too fast, somebody will say, Oh, look at you, you typical man. You say, why? They say, well, it's so macho, isn't it? It's so macho. They say, why is it macho? Why isn't it just dangerous and irresponsible? Tell me that. <laughs> they say, well, look at you, the car. Look what it symbolises to a man. Look, it's, it's like, it's, it's long and hard, with a long, hard gear stick with a knob. And look at you with your toy boats and planes and aeroplanes and screwdrivers, power tools. Look at you. That car is just an extension of your penis. But if that was true, you wouldn't drive too fast. You'd just back in and out of the garage, wouldn't you? <laughs> No, you probably just polish it all the time, actually. <laughs> Thank you. Bless you. And cheers. Good night. <laughs>